who have given up looking for a job because they don't think one is available. Uh, includes people who are uh, working part time but would like a. And the House is returning now for votes on the rule for the Russia trade bill. Live coverage from the U.S. House here on C SPAN. 64, House Resolution 808. Resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 6156, to authorize the extension of non discriminatory treatment, normal trade relations treatment, to products of the Russian Federation and Moldova and to require reports on compliance of the Russian Federation with its obligations as a member of the World Trade Organization and for other purposes. The question is on the ordering of the previous question. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 8 and Clause 9 of Rule 20, this 15-minute vote on ordering the previous question will be followed by five-minute votes on adoption of House Resolution 808. If ordered and suspending the rules and concurring on the Senate amendments, H.R. 2453. This is a 15-minute vote. The House returns for a series of three votes earlier today. They debated the rule for Bill H.R. 6156, a bill that seeks to normalize trade relations with Russia. If allowed, if, if passed, the rule would allow for an hour of debate and no amendments. Uh, the debate on that will not happen this evening. This is the last bit of legislative work for tonight. This is a 15-minute vote on the previous question, not the rule itself. This is the preliminary vote before the vote on the rule. And for some background on the Russia trade bill itself, we spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter. We'll bring you that interview in just a little bit. As we mentioned, the House will be back at tomorrow. This is the last bit of legislative work for today. The Senate has been in today, in today moving forward earlier today with a bill dealing with regulations on hunting and fishing on federal lands. Also today on Capitol Hill, both the House and Senate Intelligence Committees met behind closed doors, hearing from the leaders of the CIA and the National Security and National Security Leader uh, Clapper, and also Mike Morrell, who's the acting uh, CIA director. Those were closed door sessions. David Petraeus, the former CIA director, is expected to testify tomorrow, again behind closed doors before the House and Senate Foreign Relations Committees.
This is the first in a series of three votes on the House floor. One of these votes will be on the rule for a bill to be considered likely tomorrow, the bill normalizing trade with Russia. This is a 15-minute vote. Earlier today, President Obama traveled to New York City to assess storm damage from Hurricane Sandy. He took an aerial tour over parts of Queens and Staten Island. He also met with affected families local officials and first responders. Joining him was New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano and other officials. Hurricane Sandy has killed more than 100 people and left millions without power along the East Coast. The president, after his tour, provided brief remarks following the, uh, the tour of the storm damage. It's about 20 minutes, and we'll show you as much as we can as this vote continues. Um, well, good afternoon. On behalf of, of all New Yorkers, Mr. President, it is an honor to welcome you here to our city. And uh, we're here with our two great senators. And uh, the governor and I wanted to particularly thank you and particularly thank all the volunteers who've worked so hard for the last two weeks, 24-7, a lot of them. And they've made all the difference. We are getting out of this. We are getting ahead. We did lose 23 Staten Islanders here. And one of them was police officer Artur Kasperzak, whose funeral I went to a young man full of promise and uh, somebody that unfortunately uh, the city is going to miss. Uh, we are making our ways back. Uh, Mr. President, thank you particularly for all the help that we've gotten from FEMA, uh, from Homeland Secretary Napolitano, who's with us, uh, from Human Health and Human Services Secretary Sabilis, uh, and uh, all of your team, Craig Fugate from FEMA, uh, the borough president and I, and uh, the Red Cross together, and our great head here wants to thank everybody here. Uh, and we are, we have a new program, Rapid Response. We've got a whole bunch of people, electricians, plumbers, carpenters going out. We're going to get everybody back with electricity, and then we're going to rebuild in a better way. And uh, thanks to everything that our senators have brought us and our congressman has brought us, and Congressman Grimm is with us here. Uh, this is going to uh, be something we'll look back on and realize we all pulled together when nature dealt us a, a, a blow. Uh, let me introduce somebody that uh, I can't tell you how well we've worked together. Uh, the, the response that we've had is because we have. We've combined all the state and city agencies together. Uh, Governor Cuomo has just been uh, as cooperative and great and uh, forward thinking as anybody could be. And I just wanted to personally thank him for that. Andrew, you want to? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First, let me thank Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, I'm sure all, all uh, everyone in New York City joins me in thanking the mayor for his leadership, his competence, his diligence, his professionalism, his team has been tireless. And Mr. Mayor, we thank uh, all of you very much. We thank all of the first responders, every one of them a hero. We thank the state and local elected officials who are all here today. Special thank you to Borough President Molinaro, who has done a great job of leadership on the ground. County Executive Ed Mangano in Nassau County and County Executive Steve Ballone in Suffolk County, we thank them all. Most of all, Mr. President, we thank you, and we thank your cabinet, especially Secretaries Napolitano and Donovan and Craig Fugate, for their unprecedented federal presence and effort. I'd also like to thank our federal officials, Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, uh, Congressman Grimm, who are with us today, for all their help uh, in securing the necessary funds so that we can rebuild. Seventeen days ago, on October 29th, everything changed for New York. Sixty New Yorkers lost their lives. Tens of thousands saw their homes damaged or destroyed. Communities from Staten Island to Far Rockaway to Long Beach to Lindenhurst were decimated. And 17 days ago, we felt a new vulnerability for the first time. We have much to do, there is no doubt. We must provide shelter and support in the short term. We must repair thousands of homes and small businesses. We must re-knit the fabric of tattered communities. We must rethink and redesign for the long term because extreme weather, as we have learned, is the new normal. But we are New Yorkers, Mr. President. We are tough and we are resilient and we will overcome and we will be the better for it. Also, Mr. President, we take comfort in knowing that we are not alone. While we may not have had heat in our homes, 
Our hearts have been warmed by the outpouring of support, generosity, and love from people all across the nation. People from across the country have joined us, have donated, sent food, and we want to say a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of them. And let me say, Mr. President, thank you to you, because you have exemplified the spirit of partnership and the spirit of community. I was personally amazed and touched by your phone calls and attention, even during times that were very, very busy. You were there for us. You were there for New York. And we thank you, Mr. President. And together, Mr. President, we will not just rebuild New York. We will build back better than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I, I'm going to be relatively brief. I, I came up here right after the storm, uh, was on the Jersey uh, side, and I promised to everybody that I was speaking on behalf of the country when I said we are going to be here until the rebuilding is complete. And I meant it. Uh, so I'm going to come back today, but I'm also going to be coming back in the future to make sure that we have followed through on that commitment. Uh, I want to thank uh, the outstanding leadership that's been provided by state and local officials. Uh, obviously, Governor Cuomo uh, and Mayor Bloomberg uh, have done an outstanding job. Uh, to Borough President Malnaro, thank you so much for your leadership uh, at a time when the folks here on this island were obviously going through extraordinarily difficult times. Uh, the people of Long Island uh, who are going through really tough times. Across the board, what we've seen is cooperation uh, and a spirit of service. And, you know, for the first responders who are here, the police officers, the firefighters, the EMS folks, the sanitation workers who sometimes don't get credit uh, but have done heroic work. Uh, we, we are so grateful to you because you exemplify uh, what America is all about. Uh, I, I'm grateful to the Red Cross, uh, who's been so responsive, uh, not just here, but in, in disasters around the country. And I want to thank all the volunteers. As we were shaking hands over there, we had folks uh, from every part of the country. We had some Canadians uh, who had uh, come down to help out. A and you know, during difficult times like this, we're reminded that uh, we're bound together. And we have to look out for each other. And a lot of the things that seem important, the petty differences, melt away. And we focus on what binds us together and that we as Americans uh, are going to stand with each other uh, in their hour of need. Now, uh, more specifically, we are now still in the process of recovery. Uh, as you can see, as you travel around parts of Staten Island, as we flew over parts uh, of other parts of the city and, and uh, the region that had been impacted. Uh, there's still a lot of cleanup to do. People still need emergency help. They still need heat. They still need power. They still need food. They still need uh, shelter. Kids are still uh, trying to figure out where they're going to, going to school. So there's a lot of short-term, immediate stuff that has to be dealt with, and we are going to make sure that we stay here as long as people need that immediate help. That's FEMA's primary task. And we'll be coordinating closely with state and local governments to make sure folks are getting the short-term help. But what we've also already heard is that there's going to be some long-term rebuilding that's required. You know, you look at this block uh, and you know that uh, this is a community that is deeply rooted. You know, most of the folks that I met here have been here 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, they don't want to see their community uprooted, but there's got to be a, a plan for rebuilding. Uh, and that plan is going to have to be coordinated, and there's going to need resources. So uh, what I've committed to doing is to work with the outstanding congressional delegation led by uh, your senators, Chuck Schumer and, and, and Kristen Gillibrand, also working with Governor Christie and the Jersey uh, delegation to try to come up with a game plan for how we're going to be able to resource the rebuilding process. Uh, and I'm confident, as Governor Cuomo said, that we're going to be able to do it. Uh, but it's going to require everybody uh, focus on getting the job done. We're going to have to 
put some of the turf battles aside. We're going to have to make sure that everybody's focused on doing the job uh, as opposed to worrying about who's getting the credit or who's getting the contracts or all that stuff that sometimes goes into the rebuilding process. On the federal level, because this is going to be such a big job, I wanted to assign one particular person who would be in charge from our perspective, who would be our point person, because FEMA basically runs the recovery process. It doesn't focus on the rebuilding. For that, we've got to have all government agencies involved. Janet Napolitano has done a great job uh, with respect to DHS, uh, but we thought it would be good to have a New Yorker uh, who's going to be the point person. And so uh, our outstanding uh, uh, HUD uh, secretary, uh, Sean Donovan, uh, who used to be the head of the New York Housing Authority, so he knows a little bit about uh, New York and building, uh, is going to be our point person, and he's going to be working with the mayor, the governor, the borough presidents, uh, the, the county officials, uh, to make sure that we come up with a strong, effective plan, and then I'll be working with the members of Congress uh, to do everything we can to get the resources needed uh, to rebuild. And, and I'm, I have every confidence that, that Sean is going to be doing a great job, uh, and so people should feel some confidence about that. Uh, l l l let me just close by, by saying this. Um, I had uh, the opportunity to, uh, to give some hugs and, and communicate thoughts and prayers to the, the Moore family. Uh, they lost two young sons uh, during the course of this tragedy. And obviously, I expressed to them, uh, as a father, as a parent, uh, my heartbreak over what they went through. Uh, and, and they're still, obviously, a little shell-shocked. Uh, but they came here in part because they wanted to say thank you to all the people who had been supportive of them. They, in particular, mentioned Lieutenant Kevin Gallagher of the NYPD, uh, who, when, when they knew that their sons were missing, uh, Lieutenant Gallagher made a point of staying with them and doing everything he could so that uh, ultimately they, they, they knew what had happened with their boys and were able to recover uh, their bodies and, and has been with them as a source of support ever since. That's not in the job description of Lieutenant Gallagher. Uh, he did that because that's what so many of our first responders do. They go above and beyond uh, the call of duty uh, to respond to uh, people in need. Uh, and so I want to give a shout out to Lieutenant Gallagher, but I also want to point out the Moors, even in their grief, asked me to mention Lieutenant Gallagher, and that says something about them as well. Uh, and that spirit uh, and, and, and sense of, of togetherness uh, and looking out for one another, uh, that's what's going to carry us through this tragedy. It's not going to be easy. There are still going to be, believe it or not, some complaints over the next several months. Uh, not everybody's going to be satisfied. Uh, I have to tell you, the insurance companies and some of the other uh, private sector uh, folks who are involved in this, uh, we need you to show uh, some, some heart and some spirit in helping people rebuild as well. Uh, but when I hear the story of the Moors and I hear about Lieutenant Gallagher, that's what makes me confident that we're going to be able to rebuild. All right. Uh, I'm very proud of you, New York. Uh, you guys are tough. Uh, you bounce back, uh, just as America always bounces back. Uh, the same is going to be true this time out. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.
President Obama from earlier today on Staten Island. First of three votes on the House floor. This is the previous question vote on the rule for a bill dealing with trade relations with Russia. On this vote, the yeas are 243, the nays are 164. The previous question is ordered. The House will be in order and members will please take their seats. Members will please take their seats. <laughs> House will be in order. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, sir, I have the honor to transmit herewith a scanned copy of a letter received from the Honorable Kimberly M. Guadagno, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, State of New Jersey, indicating that according to the unofficial returns of the special election held November 6, 2012, the Honorable Donald M. Payne, Jr was elected representative to the Congress for the 10th Congressional District, State of New Jersey. With best wishes, I am, signed sincerely, Karen L. Haas. For what purpose, for what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, seek recognition? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, it is a great honor and a great privilege to welcome to this body the gentleman will suspend. Does the gentleman have the unanimous consent request? Yes, I have the unanimous consent to adjust the House for one minute, revise and extend my remarks. And I ask the unanimous consent that the gentleman from New Jersey, the Honorable Donald uh, M. Payne, Jr., be permitted to take the oath of office today. His certificate of election has not arrived, but there is no contest and no question has been raised with regard to his election. Without objection, so ordered. Well, Representative-elect Payne and the members of the New Jersey delegation present themselves in the well of the House. And all members will rise.
If the representative elect will please raise his right hand, do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you are about to enter, so help you God. I do. Congratulations. You're now a new member of Congress. Without objection, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say uh, how happy I am and the New Jersey delegation to, and what a privilege it is to welcome Don Payne to the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, a member from the, the 10th Congressional District. Uh, Don is a former city councilman where he served uh, in Newark as president of that council, a county freeholder. And, of course, he takes over after the very tragic passing of his dad, Don Payne, Jr., who all of us have worked with over the years. I personally, as chairman of the Africa Committee, Don before me, uh, we worked side by side uh, on issues related to Africa. The gentleman will suspend. And will the House please be in order? Will the House please be in order? Could members please take their seats? Gentlemen may proceed. Again, I'll be very brief, but he takes over, of course, after the tragic passing of Don Payne, who all of us loved, admired, and respected. Uh, and I sat next to Don for years on the Foreign Affairs Committee. He was the chairman of Africa. I chaired it uh, and do so today. And we worked side by side on malaria and a whole host of other very important issues relevant to health and well-being of the people of Africa, global health and human rights. So, Don, you have very big shoes to fill. I'm sure you'll do it. Uh, and it is a great pleasure. And, and members should know, Don has been an activist on a number of issues, including embracing arms. He works very strongly on uh, job creation in Newark, which has been very hard hit uh, by the recession. Uh, and so it's a, it's a great privilege to welcome you, Don. And again, uh, I look forward to serving with you in this Congress and the next. I yield to my friend and colleague, uh, Frank Pelosi. I want to thank my colleague for those remarks. And just very briefly, if I could say, as the senior member of the Democrats, um, Don uh, Jr. has um, excelled in his own right. As was mentioned, he's been a councilman in the city of Newark uh, for a while. He's also been a county freeholder uh, in Essex County, New Jersey. And I could go through the long list of accomplishments that he's made uh, himself uh, for the city of Newark and the other towns uh, that he now represents uh, in the Congressional District. But I do have to say, your father would be so proud. He's looking down today, and you must know, for all of you who loved his dad so much, that he's very much like his father in every respect, in that he respects everyone, um, he has the sympathy. Your, your father always talked about simpatico, the Italian sympathy, because he grew up in the Italian section of, of Newark. And that's something that's shared very much by by Don uh, as well. He, he will be someone that you will all learn to love the way you learned to love his father. Congratulations. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it is an honor and a privilege to be a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and to represent the people of the 10th Congressional District of the state of New Jersey. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my wife, Beatrice, for being here, my three children who did not come, <laughs> my triplet children who were the Apple of my father's eye, Donald III, Jack, and Yvonne, for always supporting me and encouraging me. I could not have done this without you. I also want to thank my uncle, the former Assemblyman William Payne, who gave my father his undying love. 
guidance. <laughs> guidance and strong support his entire life. Without his encouragement, I would not be standing here today. Our nation faces many challenges, both at home and abroad. But the most immediate concern for all of us is to help New Jersey recover from the devastating effects of Hurricane Sandy. You have my word that I will continue to work every day to ensure that the 10th Congressional District of the State of New Jersey and the entire state receives all the federal support we need until we reach full recovery. <laughs> Nearly two years ago, my father was sworn in to his 11th and final term in Congress. I look forward to continuing to build on his legacy and serve the people of the 10th Congressional District of New Jersey, the nation, and the world. And finally, I look forward to working with all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. And for those of you that knew my father, I'd just like to end, and it'll probably be the last time I mentioned it, as I went through the campaign and was successful uh, in my candidacy. After the campaign, I had time to reflect on what all of this meant to me, and I realized that there were many parallels in our lives. And I'll just end with this. Uh, <clears throat> when my father was eight years old, his mother died. My mother died when I was four. He was first elected an Essex County Freeholder. That was my first elected office. He then went on to the Newark Municipal Council in the city of Newark. That was my next elected office. He won his first term in Congress in the middle of his second term as a Newark Municipal Councilman. I'm in the middle of my second term as a Newark Municipal Councilman. And when he was sworn in to Congress, he was 54 years old. When I'm sworn in for the 113th Congress, I will be 54 years old. We will both be fortunate and privileged to serve in the 112th Congress and we have both been privileged to serve with President Obama. And when his father died, he was 77 years old, and he died on March 6th. My father was 77 years old, and he died on March 6th. So God has a plan for your life. And I think if I am half the man he was in the public servant, I'll consider myself a success. Thank you very much. Thank you. I yield back. <laughs> Under Clause 5D of Rule 20, the Chair announces to the House that in light of the administration of the oath to the gentleman from New Jersey, the whole number of the House is now 434. Without objection, five-minute voting will continue. The question is on the adoption of House Resolution 808. Those in favor will signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. The House swears in Donald Payne, Jr. to take over the seat held by his father, Donald Payne, for 13 years, the 10th District of New Jersey. Democrat Don Payne sworn in by uh, Speaker Boehner there. Now, now they're on to the second of three votes. This is the rule vote for a bill that would seek to normalize trade relations with Russia. It's a five-minute vote. And for a preview of the uh, 90 minutes of debate ahead, when the bill itself comes to the floor, we spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter. 
Vicki Needham of the Hill joins us. Supporters of this bill normalizing trade relations with Russia are saying it's long overdue and good for the nation's economy. How? It, why is that? Well, it'll certainly, uh, hopefully, uh, double exports to Russia from the United States, and it'll probably go across a broad base group of products. Uh, manufacturers are, are backing it very strongly, and have said that it could be airplanes and all the parts associated with that, including um, then locomotives, chemicals, food, uh, clothing. The, it, it seems that Russia definitely likes U.S. products, so they just expect there to be a pretty good and relatively quick growth of exports from the U.S. to Russia. Then who's lining up to oppose the bill, and what are their, their arguments against it? Well, I really haven't seen much in opposition. It seems like it's got wide bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. It's got business groups, manufacturers, even the administration backs uh, this bill. So it, it does seem to have pretty, pretty broad support across Washington and across the country for, for businesses that want to export their products to uh, Russia. Well, with all the legislation that remains to be done in the lame duck session, this is the first one that gets teed up. Uh, what are the, the bill's prospects? in the Senate? Well, the bill's prospects look pretty good. There are going to be a couple of issues they're going to have to work out. The House has attached a human rights bill that is very narrowly focused on violations in Russia. It's called the Magnitsky legislation. Now, the Senate has also has a similar legislation, but it's broader. It would deal with human rights violations worldwide. That is sponsored by Senator Ben Cardin. So there's talk now that when the bill goes to the Senate, the Senate might decide that, that it's going to add, a, add language that makes the bill uh, apply to global uh, human rights violations. But in just talking to Senator Cardin recently, he said he's still really not sure how that's all going to pan out, but he definitely wants this bill done um, by the end of this session, which would obviously be sometime before Christmas. Well, given that um, the, the disagreement on the human rights piece of this bill, what does the administration say? What, what bill will they sign when the president finally sees it? Well, it sounds like that most of the time the administration has been against any human rights legislation being attached. There's been some concern that there would be some backlash from Russia on it. But generally, even as business groups have said that Russia must follow the rules of the World Trade Organization. So I think that the administration will probably accept this bill. They did say the other day that they certainly back the provisions to normalize trade relations, and it seems like they might just have to sign a measure that indeed includes those human rights, um, uh, that human rights legislation, because it, it has such wide and broad backing from Congress. And lastly, does Russian President Vladimir Putin support this legislation? Well, I think he definitely wants the U.S. to have normal trade relations um, with, with the United States. Uh, they, they definitely want to get that, that trading uh, line on track and sort of get past some of this Cold War era, um, you know, uh, uh, rules that, that were put on Russia in 1974. Um, I, don't, I haven't heard him say too much. He's probably not exactly happy about the human rights legislation, but I think there's certainly a much broader uh, growth of, um, you know, of people trying to work on human rights initiatives um, in Russia, and, and that will probably grow. So I'm sure he'll be pretty happy to have the U.S. fully engaged um, in Moscow and in the rest of his country. Vicki Needham covering the Russia trade bill. You can read her work at thehill.com, and she's on Twitter at Vic of the Hill. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. This is the vote on the rule for the Russia trade bill. If passed, the rule would allow for 90 minutes total of general debate divided between the uh, Ways and Means Committee, 60 minutes, and 30 minutes for foreign affairs. One more five-minute vote will follow this. The House will return for legislative work tomorrow at 9 a.m.
On this vote, the yeas are two four. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran votes aye. Mr. Young of Indiana. Mr. Young of Indiana votes aye. Mr. Crowley. Off no on I. Off no on I for Mr. Crowley. Okay. <laughs> on this vote, the yeas are 253, the nays are 150. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. This is the gentleman from New York seek recognition. Speaker, I, uh, I ask to, uh, to speak out of order for two minutes. The gentleman will suspend. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. Members will please take their conversations off the floor. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh Thank you to all my colleagues from the Northeast who stand with us, to, us today. I want to particularly thank my colleague from New York, Mr. Turner, for helping to arrange this bipartisan moment of support and to demonstrate to our country how we should all come together in a time of crisis. The storm known as Sandy was utterly devastating, not only to property and to homes, but to families, communities, and neighborhoods, entire neighborhoods. Our hearts are with those in places like City Island, Edgewater, and Locust Point in my district in the Bronx, Lower Manhattan, Staten Island, Hoboken, coastal New Jersey, Fairfield County, and other parts of Philadelphia, and other parts that were affected by this horrific storm. For many, recovery has already begun, but as they begin to piece their lives and the communities, communities back together, they need a united Congress behind that effort. For others, the rebuilding has not yet begun as they still wait more than two weeks for power and fuel to be restored to them. And for far too many, we grieve at the ultimate loss. Precious men, women, and yes, children who are no longer with us as, as a result of this storm. Lastly, we must acknowledge the constant heartfelt support from all our public servants, including all the firefighters and volunteer fire departments, the police departments, the National Guard, FEMA, and particularly our sanitation workers who are cleaning the mounds of sand and debris from people's homes. We continue to learn of incredible heroic acts that are moving but in keeping with the best of America's tradition. I also want to point out that my mother's hometown of Rockaway Beach was devastated by this storm. But particularly a community known as Breezy Point, where our good friend and our colleague, Bob Turner, lost his entire home, burned to the ground. 
Please join me in keeping all those we have lost in your thoughts and prayers and remember them in the weeks and the months ahead as they begin to rebuild their lives. I now yield to my colleague, uh, my friend from New York, Bob Turner. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I rise to recognize those who lost their homes, livelihoods, and most tragically, their lives during the most devastating storm ever to hit the Northeast. For the heroic efforts of New York's police, fire department, and sanitation workers who are on the scene immediately forsaking their own personal interests and safety, and for all those affected by the hurricane, I ask that the House stand and engage in a moment of silence. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Thank you. Without objection, five-minute voting will continue. The unfinished business is a vote on the motion of the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, to suspend the rules and concur in Senate Amendment H.R. 2453, on which the yeas and the nays were ordered. The clerk will, will report the title of the bill. H.R. 2453, an act to require the Secretary of the Treasury to mint coins in commemoration of Mark Twain. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate amendments? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. Before the moment of silence, the House approving the rule for debate for the uh, Russia trade relations bill, 90 minutes of general debate. That's likely to happen tomorrow. Also tomorrow, tomorrow off the, the floor of the House and Senate, the Intelligence Committees will meet once again to look at the attacks on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi. Former CIA Director David Petraeus is expected to testify behind closed doors. We get a preview of that testimony and a look at today's closed door hearings from a Capitol Hill reporter. Emily Cadet with Roll Call joins us. What more do lawmakers want to know about the attacks that occurred against the U.S. consulate in Benghazi? Well, I think lawmakers are trying to piece together a lot of different pieces of information here. They're dealing with the intelligence community, they're dealing with the State Department, and they also say they want to hear more from the Defense Department. So it's a little bit of a puzzle in the way they're trying to get information from each different agency and what each agency was doing in the lead up and then over the course of the attack. So today, for example, it was the intelligence community's turn to come up to the Capitol and testify in front of the House and Senate intelligence communities to talk about the intelligence that they had before the attack on September 11th and then how they gained intelligence about what was happening during the attack, attack and who was perpetrating that attack and why it was so confused afterwards in the way it was explained to the American people and to Congress. What sort of specific things have members said about the Obama administration's re response that they're saying has not been adequate enough? Well, you hear different things, of course, from Democrats and from Republicans. Um, Republicans are particularly critical. Um, they believe that the Obama administration should have known right away that this was not a, a spontaneous attack, not part of a, a protest, for example. So they want to understand, in the words of Susan Collins yesterday, who knew what when? What did the president know about the attack? What did his national security team know about the attack? And they also want to know who knew about some of these security concerns in the lead up to the attack because there were people in Tripoli in Libya with the State Department saying that there wasn't enough security concern because of some of the things that were going on in Libya at the time. The trio of Senators McCain, Graham, and, and, uh, and Ayotte yesterday uh, made remarks about U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice. What did they say, and what does it mean in context to the uh, Benghazi attacks? Well, basically what they said is they don't trust her. They think that she should have known better than to say five days after the attack that it looked to be a spontaneous response to an anti-Muslim video. They said she should have known that it was clear that there were some organized elements to this attack, that it looked like a terrorist attack, and they think that she sort of spun this for, for Obama's political gain to help defend the White House. Now, 
Of course, that's not what the White House is saying. And actually, today in one of the intelligence briefings, we heard from a Democrat House member who was there who said that the intelligence community reaffirmed that that was the best information they had available at the time. That's what they had given Susan Rice. She was just repeating the information that they had provided her. Well, now those intelligence committees, uh, committees you mentioned the closed-door meetings on the Thursday meetings, and they'll hear from David Petraeus, the just-resigned CIA director. What specifically do they want to know from former director uh, Petraeus? Well, that will be bright and early tomorrow morning. We'll hear from uh, Petraeus, or they will. But they said this is going to be specifically about Benghazi. There's not going to be anything about this other investigation that led to his resignation, the revelations about the affair, et cetera. This is about what sort of information... Uh, as he had as CIA director um, about the threat levels on the ground before the attack and then also why the information that was coming back to Washington about the attack was so confused. They want to understand what sort of intelligence streams he was getting in real time and why they made a mistake in the way they initially characterized the attack. Well, what are two things you're looking for in the, uh, in the coming weeks as this investigation goes forward? Well, I think the thing that we're going to be interested in watching is just if the partisan rancor dies down a little bit and they start to dig into some of the deeper issues involved, because I think there's a lot of politics still at play here. But there are some real questions about how the State Department goes forward in securing people if it wants to keep diplomats on the ground in a lot of parts of, for example, countries that have experienced the Arab Spring. Um, the defense posture in North Africa, it's a, you know, that's a changing area, there's a changing security environment there, do we want to have a bigger defense posture? So there's some of these bigger, broader questions they haven't even gotten to yet, and it'll be interesting to see if they do delve into some of those issues. You can read Emily Kaday's work at uh, rollcall.com and on Twitter, it's Emily Kaday, and we appreciate, Emily Kaday, we appreciate your, um, your um, joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Happy to be with you. The yeas are 370, the nays are 19. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the Senate amendments are agreed to. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members be